Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore the most diabolical subject of all, and that is the devil himself, Ur Diavol, Satan Beelzebub, and more specifically, we are going to look at some tales concerning apparitions of the devil. And by apparitions of the devil, I mean the devil appearing in different forms, because when the evil one walks among us, as it were, here on earth, he doesn't walk around with a pitchfork and red horns on his head, but so it is believed he does so in disguise. He might be disguised as an animal, maybe, as I'll be looking at in a few episodes' time, or he might appear in some terrifying demonic form, as I'll be looking at in a few episodes after that. But in this episode, we are going to look at the most cunning disguise of all, when the devil appears as us. When he appears in human form to trick us, to seduce us, to steal our souls, and to get up to all kinds of diabolical mischief. And so, to begin at the beginning. Which, in this case, is the Edwardian period, the early 20th century when the eminent Welsh folklorist Caredig Davis wrote that, in many of the Welsh ghost stories. The spirit, or ghost, was supposed to have been none other than the evil one himself. The visible appearance of his satanic majesty was quite as common in Wales as in other countries. So what Davis is telling us is that in the early 1900s in Wales as well as in other countries around the world, if people were being haunted it might not be a plain old ghost your friendly neighbourhood poltergeist that was haunting them, but it could be something much worse. In many cases, they believed it was a demonic spirit. It was the devil himself. And those are the tales we've got coming up on this episode. But before we dive into them, we should take a quick look at some of the folk beliefs surrounding the devil first. Because as Davis reminds us, while it's strange to say, he is often depicted as an inferior in cunning and intellect to a shrewd old woman or a bright-witted Welshman. So the devil in many of these old accounts wasn't particularly clever. He was often outwitted in many of the old Welsh folk tales, and this is something I've spoken about many a time on this podcast before, about how the wise old Welsh women or the wise Welsh farmers get the better of the devil. And the most famous legend of all is that of Devil's Bridge. Now, I've dedicated an entire episode to Devil's Bridge all the way back on episode 17, so if you'd like to know the whole story, please go back and check that out afterwards. But to recap that tale very quickly here, and I'll try to do it in less than two minutes because I've told this story a million times now, but I think it's important for the rest of this episode. So very, very quickly to refresh your memories and bring everyone up to speed. Devil's Bridge is the name of the tale, it's also the name of the location where the tale takes place. Devil's Bridge or Pont Arfvanach, just outside Aberystwyth. And Devil's Bridge is, in fact, a bridge. It's there today. You can visit. Where, in fact, it's three bridges, three bridges stacked on top of the other. And it's said that one of those bridges was built by the devil. And there are a few variations of this tale, as I discussed on episode 17, but very quickly, the most popular version of the tale tells us that an old woman called Megan Than Danach had lost her cow and espied the animal across the gorge. When bewailing her fate, her cow was stuck on the other side of the gorge. The devil appeared 
and promised to build her a bridge over the gorge so she could go and rescue her cow under the condition that the first living thing which crossed the bridge should be surrendered into his hand and be beyond redemption lost. So what he's saying is the first living thing to cross this bridge, presumably that would be Megan who goes to get her cow, would have their soul sold to the devil. Megan agreed the bridge was completed, but Before she crossed that bridge and before she lost her soul, she reached into her pocket, pulled out a crust of bread, threw it over the bridge, and her hungry dog sprang after it. So, as a result, the devil did not get Megan's soul, but was left with the soul of a dog for all his trouble. And that is the tale of Devil's Bridge in less than two minutes. I think I wasn't I wasn't timing it, but I'm pretty sure it's less than two minutes. You can let me know on social media if it was a little bit longer. And dog lovers will be glad to know that there are some versions of this tale where the devil did refuse the dog's soul. So a happy ending for everyone there. Well, except for the devil, I guess, but a happy ending for Megan and the cow and the dog. Now, moving on to the tales that I haven't told before. And this one is called The Pen. Pentrecourt Folk and the Devil. Pentrecourt is a village in Carmarthenshire. So we're moving south from Devil's Bridge down to Carmarthenshire. And this tale comes to us courtesy of a local historian called Daniel Jones. And Daniel Jones recalls that once upon a time, the devil was offended by the people of Pentrecourt in Carmarthenshire and decided to drowned them so so quite a, a dramatic start i think there he was offended by these these people in Carmarthenshire, and so decides to drown them quite an old testament way of solving your problems there i think and one day in order to do this mischief the evil one was seen going along with a big shovel full of mound and when he came to the parish of Llandesil in Cardiganshire, which was only about two miles from Pentrecourt, he met with a cobbler who carried a very large bundle of old shoes. So there's a lot going on here. The devil is walking along with a big shovel full of mound. He comes across a cobbler who's also got his arms full, but in this case, he's carrying a large bundle of old shoes. And after saluting the devil, although he doesn't realise it's the devil, as mentioned, the devil is in disguise as a human in all of these tales, and he is described as an old gentleman in this one. So he presumably salutes the, the old gentleman. He salutes the devil. The cobbler then asks him, where did he intend taking the shovelful of mound? To which he replies, the mouth Ast Cavan, to the mouth of Ast Cavan, which at the time Davis was writing this would have been known for its mill. Ast Cavan Mill, which was powered by the strong waters of the river Tyvee, the Avon Tyvee, and was part of the booming textile industry in this part of Wales. But back to the tale, he was heading to Ast Cavan on the river Tyvee, and when the cobbler asked him for what purpose, the devil or the old gentleman replied, to dam the river Tyvee, so as to drown the people of Pentrecourt. And again, as I mentioned at the start of this tale, I love how blunt the devil is about this. He's not pretending to be doing something wholesome to get away with it. He's straight to the point, straight to the diabolical point. Look, I'm just going to block this dam and I'm going to drown a load of people and then we'll all drink wine and party and dance around a fire on the mountain all night, which uh, which sounds like a great Saturday night, doesn't it? Well, not, not, not the drowning people bit, but the rest of it, drinking wine on, on a Welsh mountain. But anyway, back to it. The cobbler was a very shrewd man. Not that you needed to be particularly bright to work out what the devil's intentions were here, but he was a very shrewd man, we were told. And in order to frustrate the evil designs of the old gentleman, he told him that the place he intended to dam the river was very far away. And I really am fighting the urge not to make a Father Ted joke right now, but but I can't go off on any tangents on this episode. There's way too much to squeeze in, but it was very far away. And how far is it? Asked the devil. I cannot tell you the exact distance, replied the cobbler. But in walking from there, I have worn out all these shoes. And conveniently, he just happened to be carrying armfuls of 
broken old shoes. To which the devil replied, well, if that is so, it is too far, for I am already tired. And on that spot, down did he throw the shovelful of mound. And the shovelful he threw down is to be seen there to this day. And we are told it is known as Knuck Coidvoil. And I'm ashamed to say that I'm not familiar with Knuck Coidvoil myself, but I'm assuming it's some kind of landmark. Knuck means knoll, knoll with a K, K N O L L, or a small hill. And if it still exists, I would love to go and visit there the next time I'm in that part of Carmarthenshire. And if anyone listening knows of the existence of this, this knoll or this small hill, again, please let me know via the usual channels. Now, moving on, and that's the devil appearing as an old gentleman, but he would also appear as a younger man or a younger woman. And we are told that it was once believed that the evil one, either from lust or from nefarious designs, assumed the form of a young man or a young woman. And the following two stories, the first from South Pembrokeshire, the other from Gower, have reference to this belief. And the first of those two tales from South Pembrokeshire is entitled A Demon Steward. And it comes to us courtesy of none other than Gerald of Wales. Good old Gerald of Wales, who very briefly, if, if you aren't familiar with Gerald, Gerald was a 12th century holy man and historian and a clerk who travelled Britain and Ireland back in the day and wrote lots of important works as he did so, which I believe continue to frustrate history students to this day. And that's a very quick summary of who he is. Apologies, I'll return to, to Gerald in a bit more detail at a later date. But it's thanks to him that we have this tale, which he tells us took place in the province of Pembroke. And it concerns an instance of a spirit appearing in the house of Alido de Stackpole. And the spirit appeared to quote, not only sensibly, but visibly under the form of a red haired young man who called himself Simon. So the spirit appeared as a red haired young man calling himself Simon. And to continue, upon arriving at the house, he first seized the keys from the person to whom they were entrusted, and he impudently assumed the steward's office. He just took the role, he claimed the role for himself, and he managed so prudently and so providently that all things seem to abound under his care. So after taking this role, he did a very good job. And we are told there was no deficiency in the house. And whatever the master or mistress secretly thought of having for their daily use or provision, he procured with wonderful agility and without any previous directions, saying... You wished that to be done, and it shall be done for you. So this Simon turns up out of nowhere, gets himself into the house, appears to be the perfect servant doing anything and everything his master or mistress could think of and not even ask for, but their secret desires. It was as if he could read their mind and to just make their dreams come true, I guess. And to continue, he was also well acquainted with their treasures and secret hoards and sometimes upbraided them on that account. For as often as they seemed to act sparingly and avariciously, he used to say, why are you afraid to spend that heap of gold or silver since your lives are so short duration and the money you so cautiously hoard up will never do you any service. So maybe not quite the perfect servant then because he is, he is telling them off for hoarding all this money and not using it. He, he's given them a guilt trip in the way about hoarding their wealth. And frankly, to me, this sounds more like a, a Christian thing to be doing rather than something the devil would be doing. He's saying to them, look, don't hoard this money, put it out into the world. But to return to the tale, this Simon is also very Christian, let's say very charitable. 
when it comes to the servants. And he would give the choicest meat and drink to the rustics and the hired servants, saying that those persons should be abundantly supplied by whose labours they were acquired. Whatever he determined should be done, whether pleasing or displeasing to his master or mistress, for, as we have said before, he knew all of their secrets, he completed in his usual expeditious manner without their consent. So there's two sides to this, really. Yes, he was keeping his master and his mistress happy. He knew their secret desires and he was satisfying them. And what exactly they were, I don't know. Maybe that's for the best. But he was also disobeying them and making sure that all the lowly servants were being treated almost just as well. They were also getting the best food, the best drink and presumably having the best times they'd had in their lives. Now, I did mention that some of this activity does sound a little bit more Christian than the devil's work, shall we say. But that wasn't always quite the case, because they noticed something a little bit strange about this red-headed youth called Simon. Because, to quote, he never went to church or uttered one Catholic word. He did not sleep in the house, but was ready at his office in the morning, like he just magically appeared there somehow. And, worst of all, worst of all as far as they were concerned, he was at length observed by some of the family to hold his nightly converse near a mill and a pool of water. Yes, back to mills and water in West Wales, but this was a clear sign he was up to no good at night. He was holding nightly converse near a mill or a pool of water, and as a result, they had no choice but to get rid of him, to sack Simon, and to return to the tale, upon which discovery, upon discovering about his nightly antics, he was summoned the next morning before the master of the house and his lady, and receiving his discharge, delivered up the keys which he had held for upward of 40 days. And after being earnestly interrogated at his departure who he was, he answered that he was begotten upon the wife of a rustic in the parish by a demon in the shape of her husband, naming the man and his father-in-law, then dead, and his mother still alive, the truth of which the woman upon examination openly avowed. So there's a lot going on there in that big reveal, and now we're drifting more into Greek mythology territory than the old biblical tales. And on the one hand, it sounds like something from the omen, because according to this tale, his mother had accidentally slept with a demon disguised as his father, and she was still alive at the time to seemingly corroborate this tale. She, she said, yes, I accidentally slept with a demon because I thought it was his father. Well, not father, husband. She thought it was her husband, but you know what I mean. And the result was Simon, this red-headed young man called Simon. And so was he, was he the Antichrist? I mean, he sounds like quite a helpful young man, albeit with some devilish behaviour in there. Who knows? Either way... He lost his job and Antichrist or not, he was unemployed, but I would imagine he wasn't unemployed for too long. Now, moving on to the second of our tales concerning the devil appearing as a young man or a young woman, this time we're moving eastwards along the coast towards Gower, lovely Gower. And this tale is imaginatively titled A Demon Tempting a Young Maiden in Gower. Now, this tale comes to us courtesy of a Mr. Evans, who we are told is also an eminent folklorist of Llan Gunnoid. Good old Llan Gunnoid as well. Mary Lloyd country even further down the coast. And Mr. Evans tells us that once upon a time, all the best tales start with once upon a time. Once upon a time, there lived a fair and gentle maiden in the neighbourhood of the Demon's Rock. And if that doesn't set alarm bells ringing, nothing will. It's literally called Demon's Rock. But there was a fair and gentle maiden there who often wandered out in the sunset 
and balmy summer evenings to meet her lover and would return with her countenance radiant with joy and the bright light of inexpressible rapture beaming in her love-lighted eye, which is a very poetic way of saying that she had a good time. And evening after evening, would she stray out alone to the trysting place to meet her lover, and seemed as happy as a bird that warbles its morning song when the early sun gladdens the earth. And I'll tell you what, this Mr. Evans, he might well be an eminent folklorist. He is most definitely a budding poet. But back to it, and however it chanced that one of her companions followed her one moonlight night, saw the maiden go to a wide-spreading oak, and heard the whispering soft and low. So she followed her to this widespread in oak. She thought she could hear some muffled whispering going on. And I think this has parallels with our last tale of Simon sneaking off in the night to get up to whatever he was getting up to. But in this case, the friend who had followed her was surprised that she could not observe anyone. Neither could she hear any reply to the maiden's sweet and loving voice. So she appeared to be talking to herself, and affrightened, her friend hastened back and told the others what she'd seen and felt, that a mysterious dread had crept over her while listening and watching her companion. And they decided to keep the whole thing secret for now and question the maiden on her return. And when she returned, they had a lot of questions. Why was she sneaking off to talk to herself? And why did it result in this feeling of dread? Well, she said that her lover was a gentleman and that she had promised to meet him the next evening in the same spot. So the next evening, they followed her again and saw her addressing the empty air. They felt assured now that it must be the spirit of darkness that was tempting this girl. Her companions warned her and told her how she had been watched and that they could not see who or whom she spoke to. Now, after hearing this, she was a little bit spooked, as you would be. Was she really going out with a demon? Well, to continue, she became alarmed but yet could not refrain from meeting her lover. And she had made a vow and bound herself by a solemn promise to meet him in this valley in the dead hour of the night. She was bound to go alone. It was a fearful trial. The night came, the moon hid itself, and dark clouds swept hurriedly across the sky. With blanched cheeks and trembling steps, the maiden approached the appointed place. But this time, she did something different, because we are told that, having spoken to her friends, she held, firmly grasped in her hand, a Bible. And as the traitor approached, as he's described, a straggling gleam of moonshine revealed his form. And, oh, horrible to relate, she saw the cloven hoof, with one long piercing cry for protection from heaven she fled. At the same instant, the valley was filled with wild, unearthly shrieks. The roar of the deafening thunder shook the hills to their foundations. Wild and blinding lightnings, together with yells and howls from the legions of baffled fiends, rushed by on the startled air which is one heck of a description. I did say he was poetic. She's uncovered her lover's true identity. She saw that cloven hoof, and as a result, it sounds like hell on earth has broken out. And to continue, the bewildered whirlwinds dashed through the woodlands, snapping the oaks of a century like fragile reeds, or hurling them like feathers down into the brook. Now a boiling torrent that swept all before it. And after all of that, the next morning, a strange scene of devastation presented itself, and the woods seemed crumbled up. 
The valley was a chaotic mess of confusion, while in the centre of the hamlet was this huge stone, which they say the vengeful demon tore from its firm bed on the hillside and flung it at the flying maiden as she evaded his grasp. It remains in the spot where it was cast and is known as the Demon's Rock. And I think we can say that escalated pretty quickly. What an ending to this tale and what an ending to this episode. Absolute devastation and carnage when the devil is foiled by God's word in the Bible. And let's hope when he threw that big rock at her, that big rock that became known as Demon's Rock, let's just hope she stepped out of the way at the time. And finally, to wrap things up, just in case you thought that might be an isolated incident or something that, you know, only happens to lovesick girls, we are told that there is also a story all over Wales of the Evil One appearing to a young man as a lovely young lady. So there are similar tales out there where the roles are reversed, where it's a young man sneaking off to meet a lovely young lady, presumably with similar catastrophic endings if or when the devil is discovered. And so ends another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. As mentioned at the start, I've got a few more episodes coming up about the devil appearing in different disguises. The next one in a few episodes time is going to be about the devil appearing as animals. Think Black Philip, that kind of thing. And a few episodes after that, we'll be looking at the devil appearing in more terrifying demonic forms. And I am sure the devil is something of a, a, reg, a reoccurring character on this podcast. He's been on quite a few episodes before now as well. I'm sure he'll crop up again and again. And if you don't want to miss any of those episodes as usual if you haven't already please consider hitting the subscribe button and if you've enjoyed this episode and you would like to support the podcast you can also treat me to a coffee via my website which is always hugely appreciated or you could leave a nice review give it a quick thumbs up quick five stars whatever the options are on whatever platform you are consuming this on and it all helps spread the word if you'd like more ghosts and folklore you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And as well as this podcast, I've also written a number of books about similar weird and wonderful subjects, which are available from all good bookshops, offline and on. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Reese. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And remember, the next time you get invited on a date, on a full moon night, at the dead of night, beside a lake, with a whispering strange young man or lady, it might be best to take a Bible. Until next time, no star. <laughs>